So the last part of chapter 26 has to do with um, how we actually draw our phylogenetic trees. So first we're going to talk about um, how phylogeny is related to the continents drifting around. So um, what a lot of people remember is Pangaea, but they don't know that Pangaea actually um, came together. So there was like actual separate pieces first that came together and then it broke apart. Um, so if you think about it, you've got these, these pieces of land that are separate from one another and all of a sudden they come together, there's going to be a lot of major changes that are happening. So one of them is that you've got these species that are isolated all of a sudden coming together and now they're going to be competing with one another. Then um, the total amount of shoreline was going to be reduced um, because as you're you know, pushing everything together, now the shoreline's only on the outside. Um, the ocean basins got deeper and that lowered sea level and then the ocean currents obviously were going to change because all of the continents are moving around. So if we go here, I think I've got a picture of, there's Pangaea when the continents were cuddling. So you can see here how on the outside here is going to be where um, that shoreline is, right? So you have reduced the shoreline. So then the next thing that happened was Pangaea started to break apart. Um, so this is actually Pangaea here, and so um, you can see it, uh, it's going to start to break apart. Now, when you have something like that happening, um, you're going to have geographic isolation happen again, but then we can actually use that as clues. We talked about that with biogeography to see where organisms used to be located and, co and common ancestry they might have. Okay. So now drawing phylogenetic trees. So if you look at this picture, these are phylogenetic trees. And um, each time it branches off, that's called a clade. And so that's what um, we're going to be talking about is how you figure out how to draw a clade like that. <clears throat> so um, going back to that picture, there are, if you look at this, one th I'm going to make it bigger for you here. Okay, one thing you want to notice is that if you look at just the gray, the actual tree itself, these are all going to be exactly the same. And um, let's say that we're talking about, let's say that A is humans, apes, gorillas, and then we've got um, worms and insects and sea stars and clams, right? So those are all of our different organisms we're talking about. So. <clears throat> Basically, what these three are showing is if we were to talk about A, B, and C as a group, or if we were going to talk about D, E, and F as a group, what we call them, okay? So A, B, and C, if we're just talking about them, that's called a monophyletic group because it's including all of these species here and their common ancestors. So basically, all of these are closely related because they came from the same ancestor. Now, it would not be monophyletic if we said <clears throat> that we are going to do A, B, and C and include D, right? Because D has a different ancestor down here. Okay, the next, if we were talking about D, E, and F, that would be called a paraphyletic group. And the reason it's called paraphyletic is because we've included most of the descendants of that ancestor, but we've left out one of them. So that's very indicative of a paraphyletic group. Now, if we were going to do D, E, and F and include C, that would be um, our next one, which is called a polyphyletic group. If we were going to do D, E, F, and G, that would be a monophyletic group, okay, because we've included all of them from that ancestor. So then the last one, polyphyletic group, is going to be if we talk about a monophyletic group and then we include an outlier. So those are the three kind of groupings we can do when we talk about phylogenetic trees and certain groups of organisms at the same time. Okay, we're going to come back to that picture. <clears throat> so when you're constructing a cladogram, and I should say, I'm not going to actually ever have you do one on like an exam, but you should understand the process of it. Um, the first thing we talked about that you need to figure out is homologous characteristics versus analogous. So remember, homologous is the one that we want to use for it. Analogous is something we could be tricked by. Analogous would be like the bird's wing and the insect's wing that don't suggest common ancestry. So once you've figured that out, you're going to identify what are called shared primitive characteristics and shared derived characteristics. So going back to, yeah, okay, we can look at this picture here. Okay, don't worry about the stuff on the side. Um, let's look at the tree. So we've got a lancelet, which is like a fish that doesn't have a backbone. 
Then we've got a lamprey, which is like an eel, um, a tuna, a salamander, a turtle, and a leopard. Okay, so if we were talking about um, the salamander, the turtle, and the leopard, a shared primitive characteristic would be that they all have four walking legs. Okay, um, a shared derived character would be something only the turtle and the leopard have in common, which in this case is an amniotic egg. Okay, so a shared primitive characteristic is going to be more towards the ancestral side of the cladogram, and a shared derived characteristic is usually going to be just one clade and something they all have in common. So um, what we've done here in this picture is this kind of shows you how you could draw a cladogram and you can make a chart using major characteristics that usually like determine like a, a phylum or something like that. And so in this category we've decided to choose vertebral column, hinged jaws, walking legs, amniotic egg, and hair. And then what you do is you look at these organisms, and if they have that characteristic, you're going to give them um, a 1. If they don't have the characteristic, you give them a 0. So you can see the lancelet doesn't have any of those characteristics, so it gets zeros all the way down. And um, since it got zeros all the way down, that's going to be what we call the out group. And in that category, that means everybody else is the in group. So that would be the first branch that you would draw out, and you can see here we've drawn that branch out here. Now if we look at the next characteristic, hinge jaws. Everybody seems to have the hinge jaws except for the lamprey, so that's the next out group, and you can see how it's branched out there. So that's how they draw them. Um, like I said, I would never have you actually use this to make a cladogram, but I would expect you to be able to pick out who the out group is or something like that. Okay, so let's just get to your notes. There's our in-groups and out-groups. Whoops. Oh, and that's it for this chapter.